Okay, let's talk about quartal and quintal harmony. These are pretty darn straightforward ideas, so this might be a slightly shorter lecture, but um, basically the concept here is, again, we're, we're in this unit where composers, in the context of tonality or atonality or some other type of tonality, uh, dealing with chords that are not necessarily normal triads or seventh chords or that we've been used to. And okay, what are the other possibilities? Well, the first thing, and I know that Schoenberg wrote about this, um, and of course Charles Ives, again, who is the composer that's, that used every single technique we learn in, in this uh, class usually before anybody else did. Anyway, but we notice that traditionally chords are made out of thirds. Third here and a third there, or minor third, major third, and seventh chords, the same thing. Major third, minor third, minor third, or major third, minor third, major third, or minor third, major third, minor third. We're familiar with all those chords, major, minor, diminished, diminished seventh. It's all about thirds, right? Well, what if we built chords out of another interval? Um, and the next one after the third is the fourth. Um, it's a little bit trickier because, you know, we can build a triad out of thirds and it's contained within an octave. We can do these inversions or rotations. Now, if we build out of um, fourths, uh, it's a little bit different, but let's look at this for a minute. There are kind of, Dr. Hicks talks about, let's start with quartal harmony. Dr. Hicks talks about two different kinds of quartal harmony. One of them is straight, perfect fourths. And of course, we're familiar with this sound. You know, in old time TV and movie themes, there used to be... Something like that. So building up these pyramid chords, etc. The cool thing about that is if we can go back to our pitch class set theory. The perfect fourth is five semitones. Well, five semitones is not a factor of twelve, um, and it's not even a a multiple of a factor of twelve. In fact, it is of course a prime number. So what we're going to find is if we keep adding fives, we're not going to get to a multiple of 12, which is the number of semitones in an octave, until, you know, basically, what, 5 times 12, I think. Which means if we go up in perfect fourths, we're going to hit every single pitch class before we repeat one. So if I start here, C, F, D, flat, E, flat, A, flat, D flat, etc. The thirteenth note is going to be C again. Of course, this piano's kind of out of tune. Then there's the stretch. But at any rate, now the other thing. So that's an interesting thing. Same thing with. Um, sorry about that. Same thing with the perfect fifth. Perfect fifth is seven semitones, also a prime number. So we're not going to repeat a pitch going up in perfect fifths until we've hit every single every single pitch class. So that's kind of interesting. So those are the perfect fourths and perfect fifths. But we could also uh, have mixed uh quartal harmony that's all perfect quartal harmony and, and you know these chords have to have three or more notes to be sort of classified as quartal or quintal harmony just one perfect fourth is not quartal harmony we've got perfect fourths all over the place in every kind of music it's when we stack them like this okay now let's go back to our discussion of the two kinds of quartal harmony all perfect and then mixed. We've already encountered mixed. Remember the Viennese trichord, which is 
usually tritone on the bottom and then a perfect fourth on the top. Sometimes it could be the other way around, perfect fourth on the bottom, tritone on the top. Of course, this is these are both voicings of the 016 set class. Um, these chords are very common. And we could go up in either perfect fourths or augmented fourths. Uh, the same doesn't apply so much with quintal harmony, I have to say, because I guess it could. But I have to say, when I encounter quintal harmony in music, it's usually exclusively of the perfect fifth variety, but there, there could be exceptions. The other thing to keep in mind, as with all of these types of harmony that we're looking at, is that they're really, uh, they're based on voicing. So I could take the same, uh, you know, set class, in other words, the same set of pitch classes, and I could voice it either as a stack of thirds. So let's say I take, let's say I take um, the C major scale or the diatonic collection of the white keys of the piano. Well, of course, I could, I could get the, there. There's a tertial arrangement of that set of pitch classes, or I could do a quartal. Oops. Four, five, six, seven. There's the same, same set of pitch classes, or I could do it in fifths. Okay, there's the uh, same set of seven uh, pitch classes, or I could can voice it in seconds okay that would be a cluster We're, we'll talk about secundal harmony next time in other words these are the same set classes uh, actually the same pitch class sets but they're voiced differently emphasizing different aspects I could also voice it of course in um, uh, polyharmony okay here's a C major seventh and a D minor or I could, I could do it like the D minor triad polyharmony same pitch classes just a different voicing and a different type of harmony as a result okay so if we're talking about quartal and quintal harmony two composers uh, inevitably come up there are lots more but uh, Paul Hindemith would be the 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 sort of main exponent of quartal harmony especially and he has lots of music he kind of specialized in it he's kind of like like the way Mio was the polytonal guy uh, Paul Hindemith was the quartal harmony guy and he had some theories that went along with it I want to play you a little of this very pretty song using a French text here are Hindemith's dates um, but you can see Okay, we've got this, um, that first chord, and then the second chord. Well, what's happening here? The alto, tenor, and bass are, are um, planing these perfect fourth, um, all perfect fourth quartal triads. And the soprano staying stationary. And then it gets a little more complicated. You know, I think almost the whole piece you could interpret as being, well, a lot of quartal harmony and then some triadic, just normal triadic, uh, I guess chromatic and using seventh chords, etc. And again, this is to point out that there are very few pieces of music that are completely in uh, one of these types of harmony, for instance, quartal and quintal. Uh, I'll show you one later, but this is certainly not 
like that. We've got plenty of triadic passages like right here. And, um, but you'll kind of recognize, especially in there when we come back to the sonorities at the beginning. But let's listen to a little of this to give you an idea for the flavor of, of uh, Hindemithian quartal harmony, if we, if we want to call it that. Okay, let's see. It's got to be here somewhere. Uh, okay, where am I? Oh, here we go. Quartal Quindle. I've got a whole playlist. Okay, let's listen to uh, uh, Sing, which is a swan. Uh, maybe we'll blow up the, the um, score a little bit. And okay, here we go. For a sec, you know, here's a passage where uh, in a certain instant we've got this sub. So, here, planing of the, this quartal harmony, three quartal chords against a stationary bass. It kind of mirrors the quartal harmonies against a stationary soprano earlier. I think that's good enough for that song. Now let's look. Now it just so happens that uh, you know my wife Melissa Heath is. Well, I think she's amazing, of course, and she's, I think, one of the top sopranos in the region. And we have done some recitals together, and we've uh, done a fair amount of Charles Ives, who wrote, of course, the 114 songs that are in the public domain you can download them they're they're they sort of encompass a lot of the techniques that he used and created and among them of course is uh, quartal and quintal harmony now let me show you a few things here first of all um actually i'll play you some recordings of us playing and singing. I'm playing the piano. Uh, some of Ives' pieces that use quartal and quintal harmony. But actually, before I even do that, let's look at one that we didn't do. And that is Tom Sails Away. Let's expand this a little bit. Okay, so this is a, a beautiful song about, you know, from 1917, right when the United States entered World War One, And of course, this is a, a uh, little uh lyric about tom going away to europe uh he says in freedom's cause down here in freedom's cause tom sailed away for over there and he quotes the very well-known world war one era song over there, over there. that's another thing again we don't have time to talk about charles ives but he loved to quote songs, familiar songs, and his his music is very rich and, and, you know, hard to pin down, very different from the European avant-garde. But what we want to focus on here is these chords, these quintal harmonies. Okay, there's a, a quintal triad, and then another one. Five note quintal harmony on top of that and it's very poignant um, so let's listen to a moment of that just to get an idea of the um, of that sonority Tom sails away
things obviously get more complex now here we have this whole passage of of uh, you know Quintalesque harmony lurking there. Okay, well, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. Of course, I hope you go and listen to this whole song because it's beautiful and moving. I mean, maybe I'm super you know, weak and corny, but it always brings tears to my eyes. Maybe that's why I don't want to listen to the whole thing. Um, okay, let's look at a few other of these Ives songs that demonstrate um, quartal and quintal harmony. Here's one. Uh, okay, my father's song. This one right here, which is interesting because there's no title. There's, this is from the... Um, 114 songs of Charles Ives that he self-published and sent copies of around to different people. But you'll notice that this figure in the piano. So, one, two, three, I'm sorry, four, three, four, five, six. He's got this, essentially this six note uh, quintal harmony and then he adds a, a C to it. perfect fifths um, and then he's got this very lyrical uh, uh, melody on top I'll play you a little of that long after it was heard no more just a C major 7. Okay, I'm going to pause there. The lovely Melissa Heath um, singing, yours truly on the piano. Um, so, you know, again, pointing out that we have these quintal harmonies. I'm not sure that the um, melody necessarily, you know, it kind of goes along with the harmony. Definitely, uh, somewhat of a tonal feeling. So uh, these kinds of harmonies aren't necessarily associated with either tonality or atonality. They can occur in both. Let me show you a couple of other songs, uh, Two Flowers, Two Little Flowers and the Cage, both by, also by Charles Ives. You gotta not get the cage mixed up with um, John Cage. It's not by John Cage. Uh, let me find these songs. Okay. Uh, uh, two Little Flowers. It's here somewhere. I promise. Here it is. Two Little Flowers. This one's similar. This is kind of a texture that, that Ives liked, you know. And this is typical of, you know, probably songs going back thousands of years, having a an arpeggiated accompaniment in the piano or in a guitar or a harp or a lyre, you know, string instruments from antiquity. Uh, but he likes to use these, sorry. Uh... Now this is interesting because the bottom of it has a perfect fifth and a perfect fourth. That's a regular, you know, incomplete or open fifth chord. But then he adds that E on. So the top part of this chord is a quintal triad. The cool thing about it is you'll notice that the accompaniment really is in 7-8. It repeats every 7 eighth notes, but then the voice is not. It's in 4-4, four, four, pretty straightforward. So that gets a little wacky. 
And then the chords, again, we find this, that the chords get more complex as we go on, but we still find these. Here's an example, these uh, quintal triads all the way over here. So they're lurking in there. Uh, let's listen to a little of that. That's one of the fun things about uh, Ives is his mixing of this sort of Stephen Foster-esque parlor music with this kind of chromatic harmonies with this more avant-garde harmony. It's very interesting. And then, um, so that's a little quintal harmony. Let's go to the next song from this set, if I can find it, um, which is The Cage, as I mentioned. This one is a very much um, uh, uh, fun song. It gets a lot of attention. It's very short. I would assume that this is a scenario that Ives is describing from his own childhood. I, I don't know. I could be wrong. But he's talking about a leopard going around his cage from one side to the other. He stopped only when the keeper came around with meat. A boy who had been there three hours began to wonder, is life anything like that? Maybe a little bit of a bleak view of life. But you'll notice it's, it's very much illustrating the lyrics. So um, we've got this very um, sort of, uh, how would I describe it, rigorous accompaniment in the piano with these all quartal harmonies all the way until we get to this one right here. And then it's back to the quartal harmonies. And you'll notice he puts these stems all the way through, uh, which is unusual, I think, to try to make it look like a cage, you know, with bars. Then all, then what's weird is the, the voice is singing in the whole tone scale. Of course, the whole tone scales switches from this, the leopard came out of the one side back to the other side when the leopard switches directions it goes to the other whole tone scale you remember there are only two whole tone scales and so and uh anyway there are lots of other little things that you can find but the main point here is well the other thing is the whole tone scale has basically nothing in common with quartal harmony. Why is that? Well, there are no perfect fourths or perfect fifths in the whole tone scale, right? Uh, the whole tone scale only contains uh, interval classes, even numbered interval classes. If you look at the vector, the 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, doesn't have any 1s, 3s, or 5s. It only has 2s, 4s, and 6s, which makes sense. The 2, the 4, the major 3rd, and the 6th, the tritone. It's all made of whole tones, which are 2s. So there's no room for any, you know, minor 3rds, minor 2nds, or perfect 4ths, or perfect 5ths, etc. So these are sort of opposite uh, sound worlds. Let me play you a little of this. Um, give you an idea. Skip ahead. 
we did a little improvised interlude between the two songs. there for a second. Another really cool thing, you notice there are no bar lines, and you'll notice that these chords in this little intro, the durations gradually get quicker and quicker. Half note, dotted quarter, quarter, dotted eighth, and then two eighths, and then a whole note. And that's kind of interesting, the way it um, accelerates. And he says, evenly and mechanically, no retarded crescendo, accelerando, etc. Let's keep going here. cool thing you'll notice that he has these three quintal chords uh, and then back to quartal harmony and then this chord that doesn't really fit in etc I can't play it right now but uh, that doesn't fit into uh, quartal or quintal harmony or anything really um, okay I want to show you one more song. This is to show that um, quartal or quintal harmony still, they're still happening, baby. Um, and this is a piece, a song by Ligeti, who we'll talk about later in the semester. Very important Hungarian composer. Um, died, oh gosh, I can't remember, like 14 years ago, maybe. Uh, but much later, composed in the, you know, the latter half of the 20th century especially. And uh, not usually thought of, well, no, he, he wrote a lot of music that was uh, quintal. He loved quintal harmony, but he's sort of not known for that. I'll show you something kind of, uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, etude score. Let's see if we can find one of these. Um, well, anyway, there I know there are a couple of etudes that have a ton of quintal harmony in them. Here you go. Here's a piece that's, I mean, I'm quintal in that most of the sonorities are perfect fifths, so it's a kind of, counterpoint of fifths. Uh, let's see what which one this is. No, that's, that's a cool one, but that's not the one I'm looking for. Um, okay, well anyway, you get the picture, but the one I want to show you is actually um, this song, Summer. Uh, and again, because it's Melissa and me performing. But you'll notice that there are these fourths. We don't really have quartal harmony here. But then we have these, this planing event, and we've got this. So a B, an E, a D, and a G. Dr. Hicks talks a little bit about this, where actually we're missing the A, right? If we had B, E, A, D, G, we would have a stack of perfect fours. We're missing one of them, so it's kind of like incomplete quartal harmony, but this is definitely quartal harmony. Um, let me switch this. Um, and he continues. I mean, this piece is very much defined by quartal harmony, I would say. There's 
and quintal. Here we have these quintal chords, uh, more quintal chords. This is, um, you know, again, once you start composing, this is not music. There's very, not really any music from the 20th century where composers are sort of following rules, except, I guess, except when we get to 12-tone serialism. But all of the techniques we talk about in this unit, they're not subject to sort of gram grammars or rules the way that we had in um, tonal music. So, you know, what we're basically finding is, you know, uses of these techniques. So let's listen to a little of this and, and then we'll wrap up. We're coming up to these quintal harmonies. A mixture of fifths and thirds. Here are these incomplete quartal sonorities. sonorities get a little more mixed or a little more tertial, I would say. This is really beautiful. An ascending line with a diminuendo up to a high note. Very difficult to sing, but beautifully done. Okay, I'm going to pause there. Uh, so that gives you a little taste. So quartal and quintal harmony, I think, among the, the more straightforward topics of this class. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. We'll talk to you soon.